So I'm not a security expert. I cannot pretend to be one. Maybe I'll become one someday. My field is software engineering, and uh, uh, this talk is going to be a little bit different, not completely, but a little bit aside from the rest of the conference. I'm going to uh, give you a kind of stern view of a uh, plain software engineer about uh, how uh, the community, uh, how, we, how I view uh, some of the issues in uh, security and how I think that software engineering can uh, bring a uh, uh, support and help to improving the situation in uh, cybersecurity. Uh, so I, I think I should use the, uh, or I allow myself to use the opportunity to start by a couple of commercials. Uh, one of the commercials is about, is about one of the projects that we are uh, pushing, that we are working on with my uh, colleagues from Acronis, uh, which is a, uh, an ambitious new project of establishing a new university in Switzerland, uh, the Schaffhausen Institute of Technology, or uh, SIT. So it's all a vision. It doesn't exist. It doesn't have a building. It doesn't have security guard. It doesn't have faculty. Well, it has one faculty uh, uh, member. It doesn't have students. It doesn't have uh, you know, a PhD program. But come back in a year, and it's going to have all, all of that. And it's, uh, we're also working on having uh, satellite campuses, including one in Bulgaria. The other th thing that I want to uh, sell well, in quotes, is uh, the next edition of our great summer school. I've been running this summer school initially with ETH Zurich uh, with, uh, since uh, 2003. We've had Turing Awards. We've had the absolute not top names in the field of software engineering in a broad sense. And the next iteration is from 2 to 10, I think it's a mistake, of June of next year in, the, in, the, uh, in a beautiful setting in the, uh, island of, uh, on the island of Elba in uh, Italy, you know, following on the footsteps of uh, Napoleon. And uh, so you can just look at this uh, website, Laser Foundation. There's a great roster of speakers. OK, so yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's always nice to have a little time to update your slides until the last moment. So this was in my mailbox on my web browser uh, this morning. As you can see, it dates back from uh, uh, yesterday. This is the kind of thing that we're dealing with in the in today's uh, world uh, every day you know the uh, so this is just uh, uh, face time i mean what wh what else is new some um, uh, uh, so, some um, a teenager somewhere found that uh, he or she could uh, follow uh, everything on his uh, friends uh, phones uh, just by uh, dialing in uh, right, uh, early enough in uh, FaceTime from Apple, and uh, the New York Times is criticizing uh, Apple for not reacting uh, fast enough. So what else is new? Right? This is the kind of thing that we see uh, daily. So let me take a little bit of uh, distance to, to try to describe with a metaphor uh, what has happened with the world of, uh, of IT. So let me take a uh, city design metaphor by looking at French cities and French castles. So, so this is like uh, Middle Ages, 13th, 14th century. It's uh, Carcassonne in, in France. And you can see that everything it says is defense, protect, go away, uh, uh, you, you are our enemies, we are protecting ourselves, and so on. Now, a couple of centuries later, you get Chambord. And so what's interesting here is that, of course, from a defense perspective, it's completely useless, right? You, can, you cannot defend. There, there, there are some walls. There, there's kind of an imitation of a moat. Uh, but it's all for show, OK? It's clear that it's not even, uh, maybe the previous one was also in part for show. I mean, if you read historians of uh, 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 urban architecture, they tell you that actually is the, these defenses were not that effective. But at least they carry a very uh, strong uh, idea. Whereas with Chambord, we're still kind of pretending there is a defense, right? But it's clearly not going to be very effective. So you can imagine the amount of social and political and military change that must have happened between this and this for the change of architecture to be uh, possible. It means that there was peace uh, after the wars of religion. It means that uh, you, you could actually have a ni nice gardens, uh, you know, all uh, uh, ideas stolen from the Italians. You could have ni nice gardens. You could have this beautiful French architecture. But that, that doesn't work if you are being attacked 
by uh, Visigoths every uh, every second week, right? And say one one uh, one century uh, later, then you have Versailles, and here it's uh, the, the social context that makes this possible is complete uh, peace, complete stability. I'm exaggerating a bit because the reign of Louis the Fourteenth was not so quiet, but still. You cannot have this kind of thing if there is constant, uh, you know, yellow vests uh, de uh, de destroying the, uh, the, uh, the, the roads e every morning. So now if we look at computing, you know, initially to me it's really started out La Versailles. This is uh, an extract from the preface to a, from a, to a famous book from, from the 1980s or early 90s. <clears throat> uh, the Structure Interpretation of Computer Programs by Abelson and Sussman, which served as the textbook for teaching computer science at MIT for uh, two decades. It's the preface by Alan Perlis, and you see when, when it started out, computing was, was fun. Uh, of course, the paying customers got shafted every now and then. <clears throat> and then, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, after a while, we began to take the complaints seriously. Okay, I found it. Um, and you know, I, <clears throat> we, we began to feel as if we were really responsible for the error-free use of these machines. Uh, I don't think we are. <laughs> uh, shaft the customer, I'm, I'm saying shaft, uh, because this is a kind of family-oriented uh, presentation. This is the word that he uses. Uh, we are re so you know, this was <clears throat> a time it's really Versailles, right? Let, let's have fun, let's have balls, uh, let, let's have, uh, and uh, who cares about the peasants uh, who are dying in the, uh, in the provinces? And then, of course, <clears throat> it didn't last very long, so the evolution in the computing world uh, has been in the reverse direction. First, we kind of made a, a show, a pretense, that we were protecting ourselves like Chambord, and then, then, then we, uh, to, this is today, right? Everything is uh, protected. You cannot go anywhere without, uh, you know, two-factor uh, identification, authentication, and so on. And, and the reason is very clear. It's uh, that we have all these uh, problems, uh, you know, software everywhere. You have the dark web. You know, it's actually scary uh, if you if you start going. If, you know, if you talk to one of these consultants that uh, offer to, to find everything in the dark web that's, uh, that's about you. It is a completely different world there, absolutely terrifying. You have the state actors who intervene. <coughs> um, <coughs> a couple of years ago, maybe uh, three now, the uh, New York Times uh, uh, site, including everything, you know, reporters' emails and, and so on, was uh, hacked by, uh, nation, by uh, the state actor of some nation, which, uh, who, who actually gained access to everything through a thermostat. Okay? Imagine uh, just a thermostat. Well, everything is uh, connected to the internet. Uh, IoT, Internet of Things, is great, but uh, this is what you get. And so, of course, this is all because our programs are buggy. It's very difficult to produce software that is not buggy. Uh, you know, we used to say uh, there is a bug in my program. Okay? Uh, it's, uh, today, uh, well, uh, this is a bug, right? A Volkswagen bug. And there's a program in, in your bug. There's actually lots and lots of programs in, in your bug. I, I, think about it. In uh, today's top-of-the-line cars, there's over 100 million lines of code. Okay? Now, lots of processors. No one actually ke really keeps track. And surprise, surprise, uh, if you look at the recalls for cars, well, uh, software and now accounts for 15% of, of these recalls, and this is two year, three years ago. I'm sure it has increased uh, since then. Something closer to, uh, to, 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 secure, to the kind of things that were discussed earlier, I'm stealing here some slides from Maurice Hurley here from last year's laser school, the same one that I referred to at the beginning. So this is the uh, DAO um, in, incident. How many of you? Uh, our uh, own uh, cyber current, uh, cryptocurrency and are willing to raise their hands and to admit it. Okay, well, this is what uh, could happen or maybe has happened to your Bitcoins or Ethereum or uh, whatever. And uh, so, this, uh, so the details, uh, you know, say 60 million uh, uh, that were, uh, 50 million that, uh, that were uh, lost. And 
what I find really interesting as a kind of, and you know, as a nerd, as a, <clears throat> as a programmer and as a uh, professor of computer science and software engineering, or, or researcher, I should say, is that it's, it's known stuff, you know? The, 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 without going into the details. Now, it turns out that one of the things I've been working on, uh, like a number of people, is verification of pr uh, programs, in particular object-oriented programs, with invariance. So, you know, class invariance is a very important notion, one to which I've devoted a lot of my work. Uh, it was introduced by Tony Hoare back in uh, 1972. And it's very different. The basic idea of, invar of invariance is clear, elegant, and very convincing. And then the devil is in the details, and it's very difficult to uh, care uh, for, to, to account for all possible ca cases. And now, so this is the kind of thing that we discuss in theoretical uh, conferences. And, you know, people look at us and say, why are you hair splitting about these theoretical uh, things, no one is really, really interesting, and then here comes this $50 million loss, which is exactly this. So, it's, so class invariant is a property that, an obje that objects, instances of a certain class, are going to satisfy before and after every application of a method. So you say, you know, you printer print this, you printer uh, uh, flush the buffer, you printer uh, send a report, send a log of, uh, of previous jobs, you printer print this new job, and so on. So these are all printer dot do something. And the class invariant is something, is a property that has to be satisfied before and after every one of these. Okay? And you need a class invariant in order to prove properties of how the printer behaves. The problem is that when the, the uh, software is executing one of these printer dot do something thing uh, of methods, the do something can actually go out to another object. And then the object comes back to the printer object and finds it, so to speak, with its pants down in a state that does not satisfy the invariant. So that's the basic issue. And you know, I, I've proposed solutions to this. Colleagues have proposed, uh, uh, other researchers have proposed uh, and published solutions. But honestly, I don't think anyone thinks that there is an absolutely perfect solution. So we are still kind of uh, uh, searching. And this is, you know, boom. This is exactly what happened in this case uh, with people who really <clears throat> didn't know what they were doing. I mean, they were very, they're very good. They're star programmers. I guess it's the people at uh, slog.it. <clears throat> they're abs absolutely outstanding. But in this particular case, they had no idea what they were doing. So this is kind of sad, because it shows that simple solutions are not going to work. I mean, you can put all the security checks that you uh, want. These are inherently difficult issues, uh, like the uh, uh, failure of the uh, Mars, um, uh, or not the Mars orbiter, I'm sorry, forgot the name, but a vehicle on the, uh, the Pathfinder, the Mars Pathfinder, which was due to a priority inversion, which is the kind of thing that uh, <coughs> textbooks about concurrent programming discuss <coughs> in a section somewhere, and which actually caused this uh, particular uh, Pathfinder to, to and, the, and the Mars vehicle to, to crash. <clears throat> so how can software engineering help? Well, there's this business of prevention uh, versus uh, cure, or if you like, a priori versus a posteriori. And this is a different mindset. You know, many of the people who are in, in uh, security are interested, of course, in the a posteriori approach, the, the cure. Okay? The client, customer comes to them and says, well, uh, my, uh, so someone broke into my system, what should I do? Or better, uh, can you uh, show to me that no one can break into my system or, or can do something uh, bad uh, with it? So this is all a, pre a posteriori cure. Okay? It's like uh, going to the doctor with, with a disease. And of course, you know, doctors uh, need business. Right? You, 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 if everyone is uh, healthy, uh, doctor is not a very uh, lucrative uh, uh, pr profession. And you know, there, there, there is this uh, famous play in, um, in uh, French literature, which is Dr. Knock. Who has heard about Dr. Knock? Dr. Nock, OK. Uh, so he, he is a doctor who makes a fortune by convincing everyone that, he is, uh, that they are sick. Okay? And he has a famous formula that any healthy person is a, uh, is a sick person who just doesn't realize it. Okay? And so he makes a fortune out of this. And well, we don't want to be like this. I mean, a good doctor 
uh, of course, is going to cure people, but a really good doctor is going also to give advice as to how to have, for example, a better uh, lifestyle to, to avoid problems in the, in the future. And so we need a, a bit of both. And my position here, my, my, my uh, place in this discussion is more to be on the, on the prevention, prevention uh, side. What is software engineering? Well, it's engineering applied to software. Uh, development. So what's engineering? It's the uh, application of the scientific method, which, for, uh, and more than that, ma management, I mean, systematic uh, techniques. And the scientific method, in our case, basically means mathematics, right? Because we don't really need uh, uh, natural sciences uh, in the physics or biology or such. We, we need logic and, and mathematics. And perhaps this is a really, really extreme view, perhaps we could need a little bit more of that in programming. What do you think? Could we use just a tiny little bit more of a scientific approach, or are we absolutely already perfect in, in this respect? Okay, we'll take a poll at the end. Uh, of the, so, no, he, now one thing to say about software engineering is that it's passe. You know, it's corny, it's obsolete, it's very 20th century. No one is interested in software engineering anymore. So uh, let me just, I'm exaggerating a bit, you know, maybe I'm a, uh, I'm a little uh, um, uh, indulging in self-pity here. But still, this is from the US. It's the Tolby survey, which uh, every year uh, analyzes what uh, universities do, in particular the PhD uh, graduates they produce. So you can already see that in 2016, there were only like, um, yes, 7% uh, of the PhDs in the, in the US uh, in software engineering, as opposed to, of course, the cool, sexy stuff, right? AI, wow, yes. Software engineering, ah, yeah, my grandfather did, did this. And, and his grandfather, his grandmother before, before him. So what's cool? Of course, it's artificial intelligence. It's uh, maybe, uh, well, networks less than software engineering. And the, the, to, to me, the most striking is this one. You know, this is what actually uh, in, um, uh, universities are looking for. So in particular, you know, both the PhD 100, so these are the top institutions uh, like Stanford and MIT and CMU and uh, Carnegie Mellon and so on, which offer PA, uh, the, the top 100 PhD granting institutions. And then at, at the other end, you have the more uh, technically oriented schools, uh, which uh, give either just a master's or, I mean, either just a bachelor's or a ba bachelor's and a master's. So everyone wants AI, data I guess DM is data management, and machine learning. Wow, yes. Uh, this is how you get uh, girlfriends, you know, or boyfriends. Uh, you, 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 you're doing your PhD in machine learning. Wow, okay. at the discotheque, you're going to have a, a lot of, uh, uh, of success. And then, of course, security, which is great for people in this room. And software engineering. Oh, uh, you would you like to dance? Uh, Oh, software engineering, sorry, I'm a little tired right now. Okay. Wow, 3%. To, I don't know what you think. To me, it's completely absurd. I mean, because after all, these schools are going to train largely software engineers, right? So especially, you know, if you look towards the right side of, of, the, of these institutions. So there is really uh, there's a, uh, an imbalance here, which uh, is going to take some time to be corrected. Of course, fashion effects last for a while and, uh, and not forever. But I think we're, the industry and the particular academia is going to come to its senses at some point. So let me take an example, a, a kind of absolutely fundamental, almost cliche example of where we need more software engineering. So you all know about, so who has, who has never heard about buffer overflows? Okay, uh, okay, good. Uh, there's one happening on your computer right now, okay? Uh, the, so the, this is the, so the buffer overflow happens when you have, for example, some field that the user is uh, supposed to enter and then he enters something strange. Typically, you know, you know, not just a name like this, but maybe a thousand characters, something like this. And then the, uh, the attacker can take control of your machine. So how does it work? Okay. Uh, so you have, 
you know, when I enter B, E, R, T, R, A, and so on, well, uh, this is in some uh, input, and so it's going to be copied into some buffer, which I call name, okay? So let's see how it works in memory. So the program is at one end, and then when, when we execute, we go, down, we go up the stack, but up means down, okay, on, on the, on, in the figure. So data for the main program, for the first routine that it calls, for the second routine, and so on, these are called activation blocks, and they contain the local variables, the, uh, the arguments, and, very important, the return address, the place where you're going to go uh, when the routine execution terminates. So, at this point, we're doing this thing, right? We're doing the code that we just saw. Okay, so we are copying the input into the buffer name. And so the you know, memory goes up, uh, the stack goes down, and the buffer, of course, name, it goes up again. So we're going to fill it and fill it. And of course, we overflow because we have a very, very long name. And we, we have targeted closely enough that we know where the return address is, and we're going to override this return address by something much more interesting. I mean, it's going to, it was going to go back to this, the, the, uh, the code of routine n minus one. Boring. It's much more interesting to make it go to my nasty code. Okay, and it doesn't work because I have a big uh, sound effect here. It's, a, it's supposed to go boom and, and wake you all up, but obviously I have a problem with the sound. So I'll do the, I'll do the boom myself, okay? Further and further, boom. Okay. This, this is what it's, uh, this is an audiovisual presentation. This is supposed to, that's what it's supposed to be. And okay, that's it. I, I've taken control of your machine, right? Well, I mean, this is absolutely trivial, elementary, and of course, from a programmer's or you know, a good, pro uh, serious uh, programmer's viewpoint, is because this code is poorly written. What should be changed in this code? It's the condition that is wrong. Oh, come on, wake up. Uh, you're all security people, okay. You, 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 you profit from this, okay. You don't write it. So we should, we should exit not only when we exceed the input size, but also when we exceed the buffer size, okay? Um, by the way, the typo buffer is the same thing as name. I, I forgot to, to update it, okay? Uh, in, in this line here, uh, the buffer is what I called name on the previous slide. Okay, trivial, right? We teach the, I mean, I taught introductory programming at ETH Zurich 14 times. This is one of the first things I, I taught, apparently. You know, since we started, since I started this talk, there's probably uh, uh, 10 programs just in Bangalore that were written with this particular mistake in it, okay? Now, there was a, a, a buffer overflow in uh, the code red virus which wreaked, uh, reached, which wreaked havoc in 2001, and the editor of Computer World wrote, you know, there's not a competent programmer in, on the planet, you cannot write a buffer that won't overflow. Uh, no, no one should ever uh, have accepted this code. It is no excuse as Microsoft chief architect Bill Gates should uh, feel personally ashamed. Well, this was 2001, and today uh, it's still there. You know, the, this guy here uh, did, 25 year, did an analysis of 25 years of vulnerabilities in uh, the official bug databases. And uh, the winner is buffer overflow. So buffer overflow is the cause of 23% of the attacks, but even when it's not the primary cause, it's, it's involved in, in, in some way. So uh, the, is this reasonable? Uh, what other, it's like you know, if uh, construction engineers systematically ignored the basic rules of their discipline. This is about, about the level at which we are. Okay? So yeah, this is a recent one, uh, uh, an example from the CV database. Now, you know, there's a lot of, I, I've added these a uh, uh, couple of slides because of the very interesting keynote by uh, Monty Wedenius this morning. You know, this, uh, open source is great. Does open source uh, fare better in this respect than commercial software? Honestly, I don't know. I mean, I've seen some studies, they're not so conclusive. What really strikes me is the, uh, 
contrast between the grandiose style of the beginning of, for example, the GNU public license, you know, we're here for the, for the benefit of humanity, please kneel and uh, thank us, and the part a little further down, which says in uh, uppercase, oh, by the way, we don't take any responsibility whatsoever, which is the same as, as in typical commercial licenses. The point is, you know, they're not better. Uh, here, there's absolutely no responsibility, and I'm a, I'm a software provider myself. I mean, for the past 30 years, I've been selling stuff to customers, and our software licenses is not much better than that, because this is what everyone does, and it's very difficult to take responsibility, you know, legal responsibility, but we are going to have to go beyond this. We are going to have to be able to guarantee at least some properties of the software uh, as if it were some other product. So there's been a lot of progress in software tools and methods, and my point is that we're not using it enough. So compilation, and uh, having compila compiled languages or, co or compiled uh, language processes rather than interpreted is a big progress because you have a step that enables you to check things and we ta don't take enough advantage of uh, what compilers can do. Type systems ty uh, typing is uh, one of the best uh, gifts of humanity to itself. And why people would go to untyped languages is absolutely beyond my uh, understanding. It's supposed to be for, uh, for, for convenience. Well, the convenience of the programmer, or the, is that what matters? Or the convenience of the user who gets hit by a uh, faulty uh, system? So all object-oriented techniques, uh, inheritance, polymorphism, dynamic binding, genericity, and, and, and the combination of these, that is to say static typing for object-oriented languages. I'm not the greatest fan of Java in the world, but one of the really ach real achievements of the Java school has been a number of verification, including mechanical verifications of the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, thing, uh, proving that it's not going to apply an operation of the wrong type, an operation that is not a, uh, specified as applicable to the corresponding object. This, in terms of actual advances in security, this is a major one. Uh, designed by contract, of course, which is one of the approaches on which I've been working, uh, void safety. So I'm going to talk a bit more about void safety because this is something that we have done with our language, with, his, uh, with Eiffel, and of which we are quite uh, proud. So the void safety, uh, I, should, I didn't even write uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the basic uh, uh, oper operation. Uh, in object-oriented programming, but also in C or in Pascal or whatever, or in Python, you write all the time x.f meaning take an object known as X, known through X, and apply a certain operation or access a certain field, F. Okay? Uh, but X is not a, an object, really. It doesn't denote an object. It denotes a reference to an object. And a reference could be null or void, so, same thing. Okay? And so as soon as you have a null pointer, a void pointer, a void reference, all these are synonyms for the same thing you run the risk of a crash. So as the buffer overflow example illustrates what's uh, good, f uh, what's rather bad for, uh, from a software engineering viewpoint, that is to say from the viewpoint of reliability, is actually good for the attacker because the, the attacker can take advantage of a crash to uh, hijack it for, for himself. So Tony Hoare, they describe this as a billion dollar a uh, mistake, and uh, to be a bit more empirical, from a, a, the, a PhD thesis at ETH by Alexander Kalkenkov, uh, which is dev specifically devoted to this topic, here is the statistic of void safe or null pointer related uh, attacks, again in the uh, common vulnerability and exposure, common vul vulnerabilities and exposure database uh, CV. And you can see that it's in the uh, dozens or altogether in, in the hundreds and it's been growing over the years. And you find them, you find these attacks in products like, uh, or protocols like JPEG, for example, you know, or Adobe stuff, things that we use absolutely uh, all, all the time. So w one of the big achievements uh, of Eiffel has been that we have made the language completely void safe by basically saying, if you are going to do x dot f, you have to guarantee that, it's, uh, that, is, that x is not going to be void. And let me, let me very briefly uh, illustrate this. Okay, I don't know if I can type. So ju just to give you a very 
very, uh, it's not very, uh, yeah, I would need a, s a slightly better resolution, but I'm going to do my best. So let me create a variable called Sophia, a local variable, Sophia, uh, which is, I think that I have a class called diagram. And then I'm going to do something on Sophia. Dot. Okay, whatever, the first one, allocate, okay? And then I try to compile. So the problem is, yeah, this is not going to work because, uh, so, uh, because uh, an, uh, an attribute of uh, a local variable of type diagram, diagram is just a class. I mean, it's one of the classes of my application. So it's a, Sophia is a reference, right? And so I've not initialized Sophia. The, one of the rules of the language is that you must initialize every such variable so that it is uh, not, uh, void, no, no, not uh, null, and then now I'm going to compile, and it's going to tell me, you know, here, sorry, the font is a little small, uh, the, the target of the object call, meaning, meaning x in x.f or Sophia in Sophia.allocate could be void, okay? So I, I'm not going to correct it, there are things that I should do in, in order to, um, uh, to, to fix this, but basically there are two ways to go uh, here, either I declare Sophia as detachable, which means it can be void, but then every time I use it, I have to say something like, if Sophia not equal to void, then do Sophia dot whatever, or if I don't declare it as detachable, then uh, <clears throat> I, ha I have to make sure that it's initialized properly. By the way, initially you think that void or null is very useful, and as you start r programming in void save Eiffel, very quickly you realize that you need void very, very seldom. Void is useful, for example, to terminate a link structure at the end of a link list, things like that. But most of the time, things are not detachable. So this is one of the things I've learned. And this void safe style, which is a little bit difficult to learn. And I mean, I, it took me some, while, some time, even though I had been one of the, I, I'd been, I, I think I can say, the main designer of the mechanism. It took me several months before I really internalized the void safe uh, mode of programming in my own programming, but it's the right way uh, to, to go. So with the, actually, this is how I'm going to, to conclude, you know, how, how I program, okay? Because uh, fortunately, I'm, uh, I, uh, I don't just uh, pontificate uh, about programming and do and then publish papers about uh, programming and, and uh, teach programming, but actually I've, for, uh, I've started, especially in the past couple of years, to, to program myself more not as much as I would like because I, I do uh, too many things. And you know, programming is like having a, a, a very demanding uh, mistress, right? You, I don't know, she's Argentinian or Russian or something, and, and she wants your undivided attention. So I don't know uh, uh, about you, but I cannot program uh, one hour and then go, go to a meeting and then take a Skype call and then check my uh, Slack uh, uh, channels and so on and then go back to my program for half an hour. It doesn't work. I have to start at 8 in the, uh, in the morning and uh, uh, do it all day and it's, uh, it's, it's very hard. So I'm not progressing as much as, uh, as I would like, but still. So actually, uh, let me just show you quickly what is this program that I'm developing. So it, 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 it's, it's in very, yeah, it's in very partial form. But by, did anyone by any chance attend the, attend the uh, SECUR conference in Moscow a couple of months, in October? No, okay, well, I presented this, okay. No, good. So I'm doing program analysis, okay? So I have a program, like for example, this one is a very simple program, which does, it's an if-then-else, right? On the left, you see, uh, that it's good, so actually it's not exactly an if-then else, it's more like uh, uh, non-deterministic choice. So either C receives A or C receives B, okay? So first I create, in this very simple example, create A, create B, and then C receives a value of either A or B. So it's, it's an if-then else, but uh, the condition is not explicit here. And so what the program does is an extensive analysis of all the possible executions, and it's, I would say, sound and precise in the sense that it's, it's guaranteed to be correct, and it, it's not too pessimistic. So the, and it produces this kind of analysis. You know, here you can see that as a result, A, there's going to be two objects plus a root object one, there's going to be two objects, and then A, 
uh, will always be attached. We always denote object two, B will always denote object three, and then the dotted lines mean that what could happen in some execution. So you see that C sometimes is going to be like A, and sometimes it's going to be like uh, three pointing to, uh, to uh, three. And then, of course, this was a very si simple example, but th then there's the uh, analysis, there are much more complex examples with loops, for example, and uh, okay, so that's what it does, and the, the, the applications are, the potential applications are numerous. You can do alias analysis, you can do void safety, which is not needed for Eiffel, but for languages that do not have void safety, of course you want to do that kind of analysis. You, want, you can do all kinds of security analyses and, and so on. So it's a general purpose analysis of the, um, yeah. But it's here it says 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm almost, I'm almost done anyway. I, I need about five minutes. So, the, yeah, it's a, it performs a, a deep, uh, sound and, and very precise analysis of the object structures that can arise at um, runtime. So, this is, yeah, I'm using a somewhat agile method. This is just a, a, um, a, a, an opportunity to pitch my, uh, um, my, my uh, Agile book, uh, I, pr I uh, produced an analysis, you know, a critical analysis of Agile methods, so I'm retaining the best, um, uh, the, the best elements of Agile for my own development. And, you know, sometimes I don't quite know whether I'm in a, in a, in a movie a flew over the cuckoo's nest. I explained why before. So, just let me uh, go, 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 through, go, go through this. So, I so th these are some of the internal data structures that we have, and are for, so a data, a data structure like this is represented by many different internal structures. Like for example, there is a list of the triples. A triple is we go from node 26 with the label T to node 25. Uh, 20, uh, 57. So there is a second data structure which is triples from. Given a, a certain triple, uh, given a certain node in the graph, what are all the nodes to which it goes? And then there's one which is triples with. Given a certain tag, what are all the edges in the graph that are labeled with that tag? Okay? And, and so on. So there's like f four or five redundant data structures because depending on what you do, one viewpoint is better than the other. But then the potential, the potential for messing up with such a complex, I mean, n not rocket science, but still quite complex collection of data structures, the potential for messing up is enormous. So what, the way it works in the end, internally is that it relies fundamentally on uh, invariance, okay, invariance which, which gives, so class invariant which says, for example, that across all the roots, so this is a for all, uh, the, um, all the elements that we find are between one and the maximum number of objects, or something more, m much more elaborate, which uh, these are for all, you know, like for all x, a, a, a syntax is across. You can see that, you can see, see that there are three of them nested within each other, which basically express the consistency between all these data structures. So this is the kind of thing that mathematicians do. <clears throat> and the point, and, and here I'm coming to the uh, flu over the cuckoo's nest, the point is that I'm totally unable to understand how one can program complex applications without this kind of thing, because what this means is if you, in one execution, like the one I showed very quickly, it means literally hundreds of thousands, probably millions of these checks. You know, checking that a reference which is supposed to go from here to there does. It's millions, you know, what, what you saw in this execution, it, uh, it, it executed this kind of internal property, it checked it millions of times. And so any minute mistake, and believe me, I've made these mistakes many times over the development, would have been caught. And then, of course, when this works, when you know the type system gives me, the, the compiler gives me the OK, and then the runtime check gives me the OK, then 
no, no, I'm not sure my stuff is perfect, is correct, but I'm pretty close. And so this is where I come to my, the, the fl one flew over the cuckoo's nest and, and to the conclusion that is, uh, at the beginning of this uh, great uh, Milos Forman movie, uh, that's, uh, you, you see the patients in a uh, psychiatric hospital and the doctor you know, giving them their uh, um, examination of the day, you know, very, very serious, uh, telling each one of them how is he or she is doing. And then after five minutes, you realize that the doctor is one of the uh, in, inmates, you know, is one of the mad guys. They're just role playing, you know, they're, they're, one of them is just pretending to be the doctor, and then the real doctors come. And so this raises the uh, immortal question, the eternal question, uh, is it the others who are crazy or me? Okay. So because the, if you're in, a, in the asylum, very often you think that the rest of the world is crazy. Okay. Uh, and, and the rest of the world thinks uh, uh, the reverse, and finding empirical, you know, strict criteria to determine who is the uh, insane guy and who is the doctor is not that obvious. And if you look at the statistics, if you look at the, uh, at the quantitative measure, the rest of the world who thinks we are crazy, those of us who program like this, must be right, because there are many more of us than, there's many more of them than of us. Still, honestly, I think it's the rest of the world that is crazy. Pleasure. Thank you very much for this vivid and passionate presentation. Let's have the same lively debate in the form of Q&A now. So I'm expecting your questions. This gentleman out there. Hi, uh, my name is Martin Rosko. Um, well, Okay, let, I will admit, um, I, I like uh, untyped uh, languages, but um, obviously your arguments, even though I couldn't follow all the examples, um, they were a bit too fast for me, but your arguments are very strong. Obviously, uh, it um, gives you a much more um, verification when you have types, uh, uh, void safety is a very strong thing. Why do you, why do you think that uh, uh, they're like, most people don't really adopt, adopt this approach. And, and maybe the same question, a second part to it, is um, what uh, do you think is... So maybe, maybe the, I should answer yeah, the first okay, question yeah, sure, before. Sure, yeah. I forget. Do I, wh why do I think that uh, many, so many people uh, use uh, Python and, and, and stuff? Uh, I mean, untyped languages. I, I think uh, w what's happening really is that we are using for professional purposes things that are really appropriate for amateur developments. So if you're putting together the website for your soccer club, and you know, it's not going to be a disaster if something goes wrong, okay, you can learn Python quickly, there are lots of web pages around, I mean, you have, and it's, it's easy to get into, so fine. Uh, and, and, but then that's not a reason for using it for professional developments where the the impact of a mistake is going to be much more serious. So the, I, I don't see any valid argument for using untyped languages for, for professional, uh, you know, mission-critical, life-critical developments. Uh, I think people forsake the benefits of type checking out of, um, of, a, uh, of a search for convenience at the expense of the quality of the final result, convenience and you know, qu quick prototyping, which is okay for experimentation, for small developments, but then gets, in my opinion, wrongly uh, transposed to uh, developments which should really follow the rules of engineering. We have time for one more question. <laughs> Sorry, if there's no one else, I, I really, yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, among the most popular languages, I mean, you mentioned Java, but uh, what would be the one that uh, you think is closest uh, to, 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 to the architecture of FIFO? So what would be a language that is spread enough to be, uh, let's say, of commercial value? Yeah, so no, I'm, I'm the wrong guy to ask because I've been working for uh, several decades on one particular programming language, namely Eiffel, and that's what I want the whole world to use. So, 
uh, I mean, there, there, there is no point in asking me that question because every good idea that I and my colleagues have found anywhere in the world of software engineering, you have put it into iPhone. So there is no, there is no need to consider for, for us to, to consider anything else except for applications that fall outside uh, of the scope of, uh, of iPhone, like if you do scripting or if you do uh, uh, maybe some, Google, some UI development or things which are not strictly software engineering. Um, uh, uh, sorry? Second best language. Second best language? Um, no, I don't particularly want to answer that question. Maybe, maybe Eiffel as it existed five years ago. Yeah. Thank you very much, Barton. We're going to move on with our next sure. speaker.